Perhaps the single most important thing China could do to ensure world peace is to outperform the island's cheap manufacturing capabilities. We all know that that is the main driver for U.S. aggression. Hi friends, hello and welcome to another video. First of all, please make sure that you still subscribe to my channel. I have seen YouTube doing some funky thing to some of you, so we just want to get this message out to as many people as possible. So make sure that you're still subscribed and you haven't had been removed from my list, okay? Today, we are going to continue talking a little bit about the concept of multipolarity as it has become a ubiquitous term across many disciplines, including business, politics, and military strategy. The idea today is to talk about its implications for the business world within the context of globalization. We are going to examine this rules-based order that has been championed by Washington for a while now, acknowledging how it intersects with and uh, potentially challenges this emerging multipolar landscape. The protectionist steps that the U.S. government has been taking for the last few years vis-a-vis -vis China's manufacturing power resembles a, a company in decline. When faced with intense competition in cutting-edge technologies like uh, electric vehicles and solar panels, well, the U.S. prioritizes shutting out foreign products rather than focusing on innovation and improvement. This mistake rings familiar to many in China because they learned in school of a big mistake that was made by China during the Qing dynasty hundreds of years ago. When presented with amazing new inventions from the Industrial Revolution in 1793, Emperor Qianlong arrogantly refused to embrace them and refused to learn from these new artifacts, believing that China was already the best. These close-mindedness led to China falling behind and eventually facing military defeat and uh, internal chaos. Similarly today, the U.S. strategy of shutting out foreign technology will lead to a path of stagnation. Blocking better products won't magically make the U.S. more competitive or solve its societal problems. It might just hinder progress. Just like China's emperor, the U.S. might be hurting itself more than helping by refusing to adapt and collaborate. I think we should all agree that there is a tipping point where self-sufficiency becomes counterproductive. Trying to produce everything yourself in isolation is a recipe for economic and political failure. The U.S. government's current approach of shutting out foreign competition particularly from China's booming economy and uh, technological advancements, is unlikely to yield positive results, plain and simple. The insularity of U.S. media and the brainwashing of their people is akin to an ostrich pushing its head deeper and deeper in the sand. The facts are in. China now dominates global manufacturing with over a third of the world's output. Its domestic economy, measured by purchasing power, is also significantly larger than America's. While China has developed a strong military defense, its challenges to the global order are primarily economic and technological, not militarily. Focusing solely on a military response as the U.S. currently does is unlikely to address these issues effectively. These prioritization of military spending over domestic needs has come at a cost for the United States. The U.S. is neglecting infrastructure, education, scientific research, and public health, all while national debt continues to rise. This raises concerns about America's long-term competitiveness on the world stage. Recently, with the suspension of negotiations on nuclear non-proliferation and arms control between China and the U.S., we really need to address the concept of MAD, or Mutual Assured Destruction, which back in the day was used to prevent major wars between nuclear powers. The idea was that if any country used nuclear weapons, everyone would lose. However, this logic seems less effective nowadays. Look at Russia, the world's biggest nuclear power. It is currently fighting a proxy war with the U.S. in the Ukraine, and they have said it before that they have a red line. Remember, Ukraine is a non-nuclear nation. 
Similar to this, India and Pakistan, both nuclear armed states, have fought conventional wars despite the potential for nuclear escalation. So, we've been playing with fire for a while now, but everyone understands that the real danger comes when a nuclear nation feels threatened enough to consider using nuclear weapons in order to avoid defeat. This raises serious concerns nowadays, especially considering the lack of recent experience in large-scale conventional warfare between major powers. Think about this. No major naval battles have occurred in nearly 80 years. Amphibious landings haven't happened since the 1950s. And the last major air battles between superpowers were in the Korean War 70 years ago. This lack of experience in conventional warfare between major powers adds another layer of risk to this already tense situation. Most countries, except those directly involved in the Ukraine conflict, are starting to recognize how technology has revolutionized warfare. However, political leaders often cling to outdated strategies based on wishful thinking. Western militaries are typically designed to fight opponents with weaker technology and limited air or naval forces. Their focus is on winning swift victories, not enduring wars of attrition. The reality is that Western economies might struggle to maintain the industrial production needed for a prolonged war against a powerful competitor. And what I'm telling you is that we live in a world of scarcity, a world of scarcity in weapons manufacturing and America's capacity to make the critical machinery of war. And that world of scarcity is what I'm trying to get us all to wake up to. A potential war between China and the U.S. over Taiwan could have devastating consequences, regardless of the outcome. Even if China took control of Taiwan, it would very likely lead to a lasting conflict between the two superpowers. This war could take the form of a brutal war of attrition or even a disastrous nuclear exchange. The biggest losers in such a conflict would undoubtedly be Taiwan and its people. Taiwan's economy and democratic system would be wiped out, and its advanced technology exports would be lost. Both China and the U.S. would likely suffer significant damage to their military capabilities. Just like nuclear war, a U.S.-China war over Taiwan would be a lose-lose situation. Perhaps the single most important thing China could do to ensure world peace is to outperform the island's cheap manufacturing capabilities. We all know that that is the main driver for U.S. aggression. But we're not there yet. It can't be done yet. Diplomacy should always be the preferred approach, even with adversaries. But the United States' current reliance on sanctions and isolation tactics hinders communication. Understanding the other side's perspective or empathy is crucial for success in diplomacy, just as it is in military strategy. The U.S. and its allies frequently use sanctions to isolate countries, to limit their trade options and to restrict access to resources and technology. These actions end up backfiring, creating resentment and hindering cooperation. While they might be very popular in the US, they can actually make global problems even worse. Let's talk about some of those. This current US approach to trade heavily reliant on sanction prioritizes national security concerns at the expense of economic benefits. This translates to businesses being forced to choose less efficient options due to political tensions, ultimately hindering global economic growth. Furthermore, by sheltering large American companies from competition, the U.S. disincentivizes innovation and discourages businesses from offering better products at lower prices. Sanctions also restrict access to crucial resources like in the case of China, rare earth minerals, which are vital for modern technology, leading then to inflation in America. Historically, sanctions have often devolved into economic battles between countries, bypassing international trade agreements. Moreover, these sanctions can erode trust in existing financial institutions, potentially 
prompting nations to develop their own independent trading systems, as evidenced by the current trend of de-dollarization. The ultimate consequence of this approach is a fractured global market, divided into isolated blocks that hinder overall trade and economic efficiency. Instead of fostering innovation and progress in the U.S. economy, an over-reliance on sanctions distracts from developing new technologies. Perhaps most concerning, sanctions can push nations towards military solutions rather than diplomacy, even for issues with no military resolution. In essence, the U.S. current approach to trade and investment creates more problems than it solves. It discourages competition, hinders cooperation, and risks dividing the global economy. The U.S. and its G7 allies might be unwittingly ushering in a new world order. While their stated goal is to solidify partnerships and combat unfair competition, their strategy has broader ramification. We are witnessing the rise of regional powerhouses like China, India, and Russia, each solidifying their influence within their spheres. The Islamic world is experiencing a resurgence with Muslim nations demanding a more prominent role on the global stage. Even within the traditional Western alliance, cracks are forming. European countries like France uh, are becoming more assertive in pursuing their own interests apart from the EU. Additionally, emerging middle powers like Brazil, Indonesia, and South Africa are gaining economic and political clout. Southeast Asia is also flexing its muscles with ASEAN becoming a significant force in the global economy. And finally, Africa, with its vast demographic and economic potential, is starting to claim its rightful place on the world stage. This shift in the global balance of powers paints a picture far more complex than the U.S. current strategy seems to acknowledge. These trends suggest that the U.S. and its allies might be losing their central role in the world affairs. Their new trade policies might isolate them from a growing number of powerful nations and regions. Furthermore, cultural differences could exacerbate this isolation. While some countries are embracing traditional values, Western nations are promoting woke ideas that some countries find offensive. This clash in values could create a wider gap between the West and the rest of the world. The internal struggles and foreign policy actions of the U.S. and its allies in the G7 are often seen as inconsistent and hypocritical, particularly regarding conflicts like those in Ukraine and Palestine. Former colonies and dominated nations are no longer willing to blindly follow the West's lead. In essence, the current world order dominated by the West is fading. A more complex system of alliances and rivalries is emerging, resembling the fragmented Europe that led to the devastating 30-year war. However, that war eventually ended with the Peace of Westphalia, which established a framework for the peaceful coexistence between different nations. This included respecting cultural differences and peaceful coexistence principles. The big question for our generation is whether we can achieve a similar outcome and avoid descending into chaos. Can we create a new world order based on mutual respect for each other's borders and independence, non-aggression, non-interference in internal affairs, tolerance and cooperation for mutual benefit? Failure to do this could have dire consequences for global prosperity and even our own very existence. All right, friends, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for watching this video. And as always, if you liked it, give it a thumbs up. And if you like the content on my channel, consider subscribing. Until I see you again, take it easy and bye for now.